All right, folks, I'm going to pass it over to, I think, John to kick us off. Hi, everybody. Really great to be with you. My name is John McDougall. I actually wear two hats, one with 350 Mass and the other with Mass Peace Action Mapper. Uh, on behalf of 350 Mass, which is one of the key sponsors of today's webinar, I'm absolutely delighted to see so many people here from many different places. 350 Mass has 16 nodes, the equivalent of local chapters across the state, all the way from the Berkshire Hills to Cape Cod. And we focus on climate change, but with a very strong passion in, I'm sure among all our members, strong passion for social justice as well, climate justice. On the state level, currently we have three main areas of work that we're focusing on. Area number one is housing. Uh, area number two is the transportation sector. And area number three is electricity generation. And there are also all kinds of fascinating local initiatives that are going on all the time. Um, but uh, having said all that, I am totally excited about this webinar, which will be cover a new topic for those of us who are in 350 Mass, namely how militarism is an absolutely crucial task and set of problems and challenges that we all face as climate activists, climate justice activists. And I can think of no better person to handle that than our speaker, Nick Rabb, as you'll find out very shortly. So uh, now I'd just like to mention that another lead co-sponsor of this whole webinar is Mass Peace Action MAPA. And I will hand things over to Zoe, one of MAPA's awesome crew of interns to say a bit more about MAPA. So over to you, Zoe. Hello, everyone. My name is Zoe Stevenson. Like John said, I am a MAPA intern, and I'm just here to introduce Mass Peace Action as our second hosting sponsor. Mass Peace Action is a local peace group, a grassroots organization that focuses on fostering a more peaceful U.S. foreign policy. We have many working groups, the founding issue being nuclear disarmament, but the most relevant issue today um, being our peace and climate working group, which really focuses on the intersections between the military, the military industrial complex, and climate change and climate justice. So very relevant. Um, that's what we're here today to talk about. And now I will pass it over to Nick Rapp, who is our guest. Thank you, Zoe. And thank you, John. I'm very excited to be here with you all today. Uh, I'm going to start sharing my screen, and this will be like the main way we interact with each other today. Um, so we are here for opposing militarism, a key task for climate justice advocates. And before we get started, I just want to like throw out a few disclaimers. Uh, one, this is being recorded, so if you don't want to be recorded, please feel free to turn off your camera and don't speak when we ask people to speak, if you don't want your voice recorded either. Um, and I just really want to thank Mass Peace Action and 350 Mass for asking me to help with this. Uh, John is too kind. There are so many really thoughtful, fantastic people who work on these issues uh, in our circles. And I feel very lucky to be here being one of those people to kind of work with us on this. Uh, I also wanna thank our co-sponsors, uh, Sunrise Providence, uh, a hub of the Sunrise Movement organization. Thank you so much for being a co-sponsor and Boston Democratic Socialists of America Eco-Socialism Working Group. Um, very, very happy to have some of those folks from those orgs here with us today and sort of supporting this type of learning and work. Uh, and I'll also thank all the folks who helped put this together, Cole, Amar, Zoe, Ration, uh, and Cole, Zoe, Ration on Tech Help, John and Diane from 350 and Mass Peace Action and everybody who kind of makes these things possible. Okay, and Kind of last, two, two more things before we get started. Um, first, I want to just kind of ground us uh, in what we're gonna be talking about today. So we kind of have the right mindset before we're going into this type of work. Um, to me, these, the intersection of these two issues is incredibly important. The climate crisis is one of the most major existential crises that our species has ever faced in its 
fairly short history on this planet compared to the lifespan of many other beings who inhabit the planet. And when it intersects with militarism, which is also one of the most pervasive and long running sort of threads uh, through human society and, and history, uh, the result is, is, has been fairly catastrophic so far. And as we sort of go through things today, we'll see that, um, I hope I convince you that uh, these two issues are not even just intersectional with each other, but are actually the same thing, the two sides of the same thing. And I you know, don't wanna sort of dampen us down with undue seriousness, but sort of uplift the fact that these things are really serious. And one of the reasons that I like to speak about climate and militarism and work on these you know, seemingly two issues, but really one issue is that I think it really reveals the seriousness that we're faced up against when we're really trying to talk about how to enact something like a just transition to save our species and save other species and ecosystems and society as we know it. Um, so as we're going into this space today, I welcome you all to sort of join me in holding some of that weight, which is very difficult. And, and I acknowledge that and um, just know that we're all holding it together. And that's why we're all here today because we can't solve these things alone. So I'm very heartened to see so many people who I know care so much about these issues and are willing to work together to try to stop and mitigate them. And one more thing, um, before we truly start, I know we took some time to introduce ourselves. Oh, in the chat, and someone also just asked uh, folks to intro themselves in the chat as well. So uh, we're going to use the chat a little bit throughout the webinar. So feel free to like acclimate yourself to it and, and, and know how to use it. And uh, we're going to be doing some, some fun stuff with it. One thing that I like to do in the chat in particular is uh, share back some resonance, especially since these topics can be kind of heavy. Um, so the way I would love us all to resonate in the chat is pretend I'm saying something that, uh, you know, I'm talking about climate and, and militarism, and I say something that really strikes a chord with you. You're like, wow, that is so real. Um, I really feel that that's really important. Just throw some like buses in the chat, just like that. Or if someone shares something back from a breakout group and you're like, wow, what they talked about really resonates with me, throw some pluses in the chat. So let's practice that. Maybe just pretend I said something really amazing and you're like, wow, I wanna resonate with that. Let's, let's all resonate together to get some good energy to kick us off. Yeah, Cameron, big resonance, I love it. Oh, it just like feels really good when you see all these flooding in the chat, you know, everyone's on the same page. And I, I just love seeing these come in. So um, let's you know do that throughout the webinar. If anything resonates with you, throw it out there and, and I'm sure other people will agree. Okay, that's my spiel. So, okay, now to actually talk about what we're, what we're truly gonna do today, um, I'll just signpost our agenda. Uh, I'm gonna do a brief intro of myself. And then we're, we're gonna, today is all about deconstructing. So we're going to start with how we typically think about the climate crisis, uh, work through it to sort of realize that maybe how it's typically treated is not viewing it in its full complexity and arrive at the fact that the crisis is very complex and keep kind of like adding layers to it uh, and processing along the way until we get to this framework that we're going to end up at that, in my opinion, makes it much easier to think about the fact that the climate crisis and militarism really are two sides of the same thing. Um, and then once we arrive at that framework, we'll think about it a little bit, and then we'll say how we're going to use it next week. Um, and I'll, I'll preview some of the stuff we're going to talk about, because this is a two-part webinar series. I should have mentioned that. This is day one. Uh, and we'll have a break in the middle, because I am human. We're all human. We could all use a break. So uh, you all have been introducing yourselves in the chat. Thank you very much. Uh, I'll briefly introduce myself. My name is Nick. I use he, him pronouns. Uh, the way I know a lot of these folks is that I've organized with um, Sunrise Movement, uh, Massachusetts Peace Action. I've organized with a group, a youth-led anti-militarist group called Dissenters. Um, and I've worked on these climate and militarism issues for uh, a couple years, like over a couple years now. And, 
they really resonate strongly with me because um, my family history is rooted in escaping militarism. And um, as a young person, I really, I think like a lot of young people feel very concerned about the climate crisis and the way our society, uh, our societies are dealing with it. And, and I want to fight to create a better world um, for the people I care about. Um, and all of that aside, I'm also a PhD student at Tufts University. I study um, computer science and cognitive science and actually do computer modeling of um, opinion, uh, opinion spread, I guess, which is like kind of an organ, a weird way of like doing organizing for my PhD, even though they didn't want me to. Um, so, so that's me. I'm really uh, humbled to be here with you all today. And I also find it nice and customary to do a land acknowledgement before any of these. So I think uh, Rishan is gonna drop in the chat a link that I'd love if you all could go to um, and share back whose land you're calling in from. Uh, while I briefly acknowledge the land, I'm calling in from Pawtucket and Massachusetts land. Um, and as I was thinking about how to acknowledge the land today, um, there's been a lot of uh, indigenous organizing reaching a lot of peaks uh, this summer. And recently, you know, we're coming off of Indigenous Peoples Day. There have been continuous rallies and protest and action at the Capitol in Washington, DC, and indigenous folks are being arrested by the state for trying to advocate for a just future and a, a livable planet. Uh, and when I acknowledge the land, I like to sort of echo the words of the indigenous leaders who, who I follow around uh, Boston. Oh, and I forgot to say, I, I live outside Boston in Massachusetts. Um, and they often say, you know, one of the things that we constantly have to push against is this idea of, of erasing indigenous voices. Like this idea that, uh, you know, instead of acknowledging indig indigenous genocide and saying, well, now there's no indigenous people left, that's not true at all, right? It is true that the indigenous genocide is something that we absolutely need to reckon with and it plays into this whole picture of climate and militarism as we'll see, but um, that doesn't mean that indigenous people are not here. Right, indigenous people are some of the most savvy and strong organizers that I've ever met in my life. And they organize constantly. And um, when we're not working with our indigenous leadership around us, we're really, in my mind, not working towards the true solutions to the climate crisis, which indigenous people know so well because they lived with the land and lived uh, in, in a much more balanced manner than you know, post-industrial revolution, colonial European society, right? So I try to follow the indigenous leadership around me. And I think that's a key part of addressing the climate crisis. So whenever we enter spaces like these, I just like to know that the land that I'm on has been being fought for, has been fought for for centuries. Um, and I'm certainly not the first person to say these things and make these arguments. Uh, it's been done for a long time before me and will continue to be done by people who we should be following the leadership of. So that's how I'd like to acknowledge the land today. So let's start with, like I said before, typical climate thinking. So this is the first instance where we'd like to use the chat and I'll uplift some answers. Throw in the chat, what are some aspects of the climate crisis that we typically find focused on in activist spaces? Feel free to just throw whatever you want and I will uplift them as they come in. I'm like on the edge of my seat. I can't wait for these amazing answers. Ooh, mutual aid after the fact, after a natural disaster happens, for sure. Carbon pricing, absolutely. And of course, this will, yeah, certainly vary from circle to circle, but there are some typical things I was thinking of. Okay, now they're really coming in. Legislation, staying below one and a half degrees of warming, yes. 
emissions, pollution, electric cars, punching through gridlock in the government, existential threat, pipelines, environmental racism in EJ communities, energy, but also farming, and land use, climate justice, income inequality, overconsumption. Okay, yes. So there seems to be, yeah, wow. Okay, you all are coming up with a lot that I didn't even think of. But yeah, so, so there are some things that we like typically see in the discourse. Feel free to keep sharing them if you want, if you just wanna you know, throw some stuff out continuously. Um, but I think for, for the sake of argument, there are some commonalities uh, around a lot of these. So uh, two things that I think motivate a lot of the discourse on the climate crisis right now are emissions and pollution. Right, whether that is, you know, some folks said in the form of environmental justice, uh, or just, you know, destroying ecosystems or uh, having like bad food and stuff like this, uh, and emissions we hear about all the time, right? Like these greenhouse gases and the atmosphere, and that's like causing the global warming, and that's what we really need to focus on. So, you know, I want to be fair and say that, you know, even though we're going to complicate this picture quite a bit. Uh, this took a lot of work to get here, so I in no way want to, you know, uh, paint this as something that, you know, was just easy and, and we should, you know, sort of downplay and say, uh, how could people only focus on these things? Because these were not even given, right? Even, you know, 10, 15, 20 years ago, people were not talking about things like this. But a lot of the discourse that I tend to hear uh, surrounding this stuff is, right, how do we get to 100% renewable energy, right? Renewable energy, renewable energy, which is a good thing, but it's, it's sort of a sliver. Uh, 350 parts per million, right? One of our co-organizing groups is named after that, right? And, and we've certainly blown far past that. Uh, one and a half degrees Celsius of warming. I think Nahi put that in the chat. Yeah, we hear about this number and it used to be two degrees and now it's one and a half degrees. And, you know, even now some studies have said we're gonna breach that in the next five years, which is scary in and of itself. Uh, and we hear about things like conservation, right? This was a form the environmental movement took for a long time, where it was more concerned about conservation, even more so than environmental justice and stuff. And this is, this is already a lot, right? But we can sort of boil it down and say, okay, this is just a sliver of the climate crisis. So now I wanna ask you, what more is there? I want you to stretch your brains a little bit, uh, or maybe you don't need to stretch your brains and just put in the chat what other things lead to the climate crisis. Ooh, Gary, starting with a showstopper. Yeah, colonialism, absolutely. Capitalism, unlimited growth. White supremacy cult, oh, y'all are like, absolutely on my wavelength right now. Yeah, overconsumption, capitalism, resource extractivism, petrodollar system, yes, consumption, rainforests, yeah, destroying rainforests and other green areas, corruption, capitalism, fear, industrial civilization, ooh, patriarchy, yes. All right, you all are like naming pretty much everything we're gonna talk about. So that's really great. Yeah, so the picture is like much more complicated, right? There are so many things that lead to the climate crisis. And, you know, I'm gonna sort of like continue this diagram building and just preface it by saying this is not even everything, but um, we can add things, right? Like we started with just emissions and pollution, but the, you know, let's add just three more, right? Extraction. Right, a lot of you are talking about capitalism and over extraction of resources, uh, land misuse when we talk about destroying rainforests or terrible agricultural practices, that's land misuse. Bad political priorities, right? So people funding things that shouldn't be funded while all this crazy stuff is going on. And these are you know, just five of you know, a broad swath of things that go into the climate crisis. So notice the arrows going in. Uh, but also I just wanna acknowledge that also the climate crisis leads to things, right? So we're really deconstructing. I'm, I'm 
playing like philosophy games with us. We're deconstructing the climate crisis. So if I draw arrows coming out of the climate crisis, it leads to things. And this is not everything, but these are some things, right? It leads to extreme weather. It leads to ecological destruction. It leads to resource scarcity. And even more, we can keep going. Migration, right? Species loss, hunger, livelihood loss, uh, loss. Uh, also protest, right? Unrest, organizing, the types of things that we do and we're doing right now. Um, and to further complicate it, you know, don't, don't be fooled, we weren't even done yet. Uh, these things feed back into the climate crisis, right? So like migration causes even more issues, right? Species loss feeds back into the system. Ecological destruction feeds back into the system. So suffice to say, you know, we could play this game all day, but it's complicated, right? Uh, and, and maybe even more so than the word complicated, it's complex, right? It's a very complex inner weaving of systems. Uh, and it turns out that almost all of these aspects are touched by the military. And sometimes you don't even initially see all of the ways the military touches the climate crisis until you break yourself out of the emissions and pollution mindset. Right. There are plenty of emissions and pollution connections, but there are also other ones that I think we need to focus on as well. So I'm going to just focus on five and bring us through some of these examples. So let's start with emissions. How is emissions related to militarism? Uh, and I'll only say a few things. And again, there's so much more that we could dive into. But on the one hand, the Pentagon is the largest institutional emitter in the world. Right. In 2017, Pentagon emissions were 59 million metric tons, the 25th highest in the world if the Pentagon was a country, which is more than 170 countries on the planet. So when we talk about reducing uh, emissions by nations, only one institution of the United States, so-called United States, uh, is an emitter on the scale of, of, of other countries. Where do all these emissions come from? Right, well, 40% of these emissions come from the over 800 known bases in 90 countries and territories across the world. Uh, you can notice as a fun thing where all of the bases are kind of located. Uh, these are US military bases. They're all surrounding uh, specific countries that we purport to not like quite a bit. Um, but this, you know, this just goes to show that you know, these bases that uh, sort of upkeep US empire contribute to almost half of these emissions, right? Just maintaining the military apparatus. And within uh, these are called operations emissions, these ones that sort of just keep the military alive. 70% uh, of these alone <laughs> come from jet fuel consumption. So every time the US military is flying planes to go on bombing missions, this contributes a huge amount uh, to emissions. And this is just one of the mind blowing facts that gets me mad every time I read it. Uh, but one of the military jets, only one of them, the B 52 Strata Fortress, consumes about as much fuel in an hour as the average car driver uses in seven years. So every time you're trying to think about driving your car less to cut down on emissions, just know the Pentagon is, you know, seven years ahead of you uh, emissions wise. So that's just emissions, right? We can also talk about pollution and environmental justice. How does militarism play into that? Well, remember those bases. This is a quote from David Vine, who is one of the sort of foremost experts on US military bases. He writes, quote, by definition, most bases store large quantities of weapons, explosives, and other inherently dangerous tools of war. Nearly all of them contain toxic chemicals and other hazardous weights. Pollution, contamination, and other forms of environmental harm are found at nearly every base. So remember those over 800 bases we talked about a few slides ago, almost every single one of those pollutes and destroys the communities that it is often forced, uh, that its building is forced into, uh, for lack of a better way of saying it. Uh, and often we think about this uh, internationally and abroad, right? But what, is, what does it look like even domestically? Uh, so the total amount of U.S. land, uh, which is over 40,000 contamination sites that is affected by military contamination, is larger than the entire state of Florida. 
And remember, this is not even accounting for contamination abroad. Uh, and just for reference, Florida's area is over 65,000 square miles, which is a mind boggling number. Uh, this is all the land that the US military is contaminating just domestically, right? So it touches environmental justice. And, and I should say these bases are predominantly built in communities uh, of color and communities who do not want them. So it's, you know, absolutely tied into the racism and structural racism issues that, that affect all these aspects of the climate crisis. Um, so that's uh, EJ and pollution. What about migration, right? Well, a lot of the discourse is saying, you know, the climate crisis is not happening, blah, blah, blah. Uh, so while many people try to deny the climate crisis, people are already experiencing the impacts, right? Some of these estimates, uh, like by, I think uh, the World Bank just came out with another one, uh, project that around 200 million people will be displaced uh, by mid-century, in part due to the climate crisis. Uh, and if you even remember back to incidents like um, in 2018, the migrant caravan, right, which is like this big political issue and the rhetoric was uh, sort of demonizing these migrants as murderers who want to bring drugs and crime across our borders. Well, it turns out that most of these migrants were coming from countries like Guatemala, Honduras, El Salvador, uh, a main reason that people were coming is because they don't have anything anymore to eat. They're seeing tremendous climate instability that's radically changing food security in the region. And on top of that, a lot of these countries are those that, whose governments have been sort of systematically controlled and, and devastated by U.S. imperialism over the decades. If you think about all the CIA sort of interventions and coups throughout the, uh, from like 50s onwards, basically. Um, so they have tremendous political instability as well. And, and migration is so tied into the climate issue that, that we can't ignore it, but it begs the question. So given that migration happens, how do we respond to it? Well, you really don't need to look any further than the official rhetoric coming out of the Pentagon. This is from a really old report in 2003 that sort of sets the tone for what we've sort of seen happen from that point onward. They said, right, given climate catastrophe, the United States and Australia are likely to build defensive fortresses around their countries because they have the resources and reserves to achieve self-sufficiency. Borders will be strengthened around the country to hold back unwanted starving immigrants from the Caribbean islands, an especially severe problem, Mexico and South America. So this is the official rhetoric, right? Holding back unwanted starving immigrants. Uh, this is how militarism and the migration from the climate crisis intersect. Uh, there's also increased conflict. Uh, and I'm, I'm really buzzing through these, but just know that these are all really deep uh, in their own right, even beyond emissions, right? Uh, we have fought wars to extract fossil fuels. And in fact, oil uh, is the leading cause of war, uh, an estimated one quarter to one half of all interstate wars since 73 have been linked to oil. And the US spends an enormous amount of money per year to protect those oil supply lines. And this causes conflict. Uh, there's this whole idea that as resources become scarce, people say climate change and the climate crisis will become a threat multiplier and that the inequalities in society will become exacerbated as militarized powers exert force to gain access to those resources. And we see this happening in places already like uh, in Kashmir, which is undergoing severe repression because it has access to water that India and Pakistan and China uh, have all typically politically shared this so-called disputed territory. But then India um, under the Modi government, which is increasingly authoritarian militarized power stripped Kashmir of its semi-autonomous status, shut off its internet, and has systematically committed human rights abuses for years to suppress dissent uh, for what a lot of scholars say is for access to resources and water. And it also goes the other way, that when conflict emerges, the capacity to adapt to climate change is reduced, and that the capacity for collective action can be undermined. By violent conflict. 
So this is all really tied in with each other, right? The fossil fuel industry, in fact, even relies on militarized state violence to uphold its operations around the world. Um, and this says around the world, but in the US, uh, a lot of you all who have been keeping up with some of these domestic fights know the story is no different, right? We saw it way back when, it seems like so long ago, uh, but with the protests against the Dakota Access Pipeline, right, militarized police came out to use tear gas and rubber bullets, sound cannons and water cannons against protesters. And then we've seen it again this summer in response to Line 3 protests, where water protectors have been subject to arrests, rubber bullets, torture tactics, all paid for by a fossil fuel corporation. So conflict uh, and, and climate and militarism are all intertwined. Uh, and then finally, the one where I said bad political priorities, we can just look at the military budget to see that that's one manifestation of it. And I do realize this is a lot of information. Don't worry, we're gonna process it in a second. Um, but this one, this one just makes me so mad every time I look at it, right? So this is just the budget uh, from, from 2019. The United States spent as much as the next 10 largest military budgets combined on so-called defense. Uh, out of the total US federal budget, there's a mandatory portion and discretionary portion. Discretionary meaning uh, we can decide how to portion it up based on political priorities. This is a, a graph of the 2015 discretionary spending budget and just know that it's gotten worse since. Uh, and this is all based on studies done by the National Priorities Project. In 2015, military spending, which was at about 600 billion, and it's up to an, uh, about 750 billion now, was more than 15 times what was spent on energy and environment. Uh, but don't even be fooled by that because most of the energy and environment spending in the Department of Energy budget was actually for nuclear weapons. So it's not even spent on renewable energy. Uh, and in fact, the US has spent a tremendous amount of money on war in the past two decades. This actually, I think, is an older figure that's been updated since. But this from the uh, No Warming, No War report that came out a couple of years ago from Institute for Policy Studies uh, made the argument that the US has spent $6.4 trillion on war in the past two decades. Whereas the cost of shifting our entire power grid to 100% renewable energy over the next decade would have just been $4.5 trillion. So, you know, uh, clearly the money is there. It's just a matter of priorities. Um, other groups like the Poor People's Campaign have put out budgets that say if we tax people fairly, we could yield almost a trillion dollars annually. If we ended coal, oil, and gas subsidies, that could yield almost three quarters of a trillion annually. That we could redirect uh, or say defund uh, $350 billion from the Pentagon budget without compromising security, whatever that even is. I feel like we could probably get rid of more. Um, and this is, you know, maybe a conservative estimate, but you know, in the end, what does all this mean? That you know, climate solutions are treated as pipe dreams. Right, while military spending is not, uh, we, I put we, but maybe this is just me, but I imagine this is true for all of you as well, constantly hear that solutions like uh, a Green New Deal, right, are too expensive, or, or a Red Deal, or Black, Green, and Red New Deal. I think I flipped the letters, but any of these plans are too expensive, or, you know, crazy socialism, even though uh, fossil fuel subsidies and public funding of private contractors is literally the same. Uh, and what could we do with all that money, right? Just 11% of the Pentagon budget could power every single household in the US with solar and wind. 1% of the budget could fund 125,000 infrastructure jobs, which we are literally fighting for right now. Uh, instead of spending 25 billion on immigration and border enforcement, it could have paid for 337,000 clean energy jobs, good paying clean energy jobs too. These aren't like crappy paid jobs. So that was a lot of information and that was just five of any of these like facets of the climate crisis that we could look at. Um, 
And right, so this is a lot, right? And the military and militarism intersects with the climate crisis on this level in so many ways. Now, welcome back. Um, all right, so we, we just like had so much information that maybe a bunch of you already knew, maybe some of you didn't know, but I just like you know, forced it into your brains and that was quite a bit. Uh, so, you know, don't fret. We're going to talk about even more things. Uh, so those things that we talked about are one way to view the problems and the linkages between militarism and the climate crisis. Um, but in, in the majority of the work I do, I actually talk about uh, some deeper levels of connection. So I'm going to motivate for, for you all what I call uh, a tree model of viewing the intersections of these issues. And the tree thing will make sense later. Uh, and the domination crisis, which will also make sense later. Um, but these are two parts of how climate and militarism interact that I think, in my opinion, really uh, shine a light on the fact that we cannot address one without the other. So, okay, we had this big crazy diagram and we looked at examples of like five of the, you know, 50 sub facets of the climate crisis and this crazy sort of system we drew, we drew out. Um, but this is not even the entire picture, right? So uh, we can think of, so, so we had things that lead to the climate crisis. The climate crisis leads to things in turn, but then there's this whole other layer right, which is, okay, when people are affected by crisis, they react. How? So let's think through this to sort of keep diving through our analysis. So I'm just going to move migration and protest up to this layer of how people react, um, because that, that's sort of a reaction to crisis, right? Um, but let's add some more, right? People want to protect the things that are being devastated, right? They want to protect their livelihoods and their resources and their land and their futures. Um, people organize, right? This is what we're doing. I sort of mentioned that earlier. Um, and you know, people get together and we want to say, this is not, this is not how we want things to be. Let's change them. Um, and then oop, I kind of spoke these. So, so these are, you know, again, this is not everything that people do, but this is like a huge portion of what people do uh, to react to the climate crisis. And we can continue the line of thinking by saying, what is the reaction to that reaction? And this is where we start to see some interesting things. So what do we see in response to migration? We see in our case, in our reality, and this may be very US centric, but I think this is true of a lot of other militarized states. Uh, we see militarized borders, right? I sort of ran you through some of these examples earlier of how we dealt with you know, the so-called migrant caravan. Uh, what else do we see in response? We see xenophobia, right? Racism pervading the rhetoric, right? To make people afraid. We see a lot of propaganda, right? The state and powerful interests confuse everybody, want people to think certain things, think that it's not happening, right? Think that it's someone else's fault. We see suppression of dissent, right? We've seen this, you know, at pipelines, we've seen this in, in local organizing, this, this sort of, you know, the powerful want to hold on to their power. So they, they sort of clamp down. Uh, and then we see a, a desire to concentrate power. So those who are sort of like causing this whole thing um, want to uh, consolidate themselves so, so they can uh, certainly be untouchable. And I don't know why they went away. That was my bad slide, slide technique. Um, so this response to the response uh, is what I see and what a lot of other people see as a typical action of a militarized state. And they're almost, these, these reactions to reactions are almost always in the service of two things. So these, this layer of reaction feeds back into two things. On the one hand, they are in the interest of protecting corporate profits. 
and they are in the interest of protecting or expanding state power. So these uh, are like, we'll, we'll take a brief look through history. These things have been true throughout history and they are absolutely true of the climate crisis and of militarism. So, um, and I should note that, that also these things then feed back into uh, in pursuit of more profits and in pursuit of maintaining state power, we get more emissions and more pollution and extraction and land misuse and bad political priorities. And so this is really a cycle. Uh, and I think we see this cycle play out before us all the time, but we really don't give it a name. So this is what I have called the domination crisis. And that when I talk about this, I call it the flip side of the climate crisis. Because if you really think about it, uh, if you take you know, the first few layers of thought, right? Like say a society is seeing emissions and pollution and blah, blah, blah. And then they start seeing extreme weather and people are losing their livelihoods and mass extinctions are happening. A sane and democratic society would certainly not have this response. Right? They would be able to adapt to these things, cooperate and address the issues, but that's not the type of society we have. Right? We have a militarized society. So instead we see militarized borders, xenophobia, racism, propaganda, suppression of dissent, concentration of power that complete this loop of domination crisis. So we would not have the perpetuation of the climate crisis like we see it today if we did not have a militarized society. And I really like, I want that to sink in because that's really like the big argument for why these two things are literally the same thing, right? If we had a different society, we would have probably already addressed it, right? And like I said earlier, the U.S. Uh, has a actually a very long history of directly or indirectly using military intervention and militarism to serve its economic and state power interests. Um, and I'll just, you know, sort of run through a brief bit of history just to show that this is nothing new. Uh, these economic interests have often included extracting resources from native people's land uh, and leave behind environmental and human devastation. And this has been the case, this domination crisis has just been the mode of operation. Uh, but, but now we see it manifesting with, you know, all of these sort of polluting technologies that we have today. So I would love if somebody could raise their Zoom hand or put a star in the chat to read this quote for me, for us, for all of us. Oh, you know what? I can't even see the Zoom hands. Oh, Amar, go for it, please. The U.S., uh, the history of the U.S. is a history of settler colonialism, the founding of a state based on the ideology of white supremacy, the widespread practice of African slavery, and a policy of genocide and land theft. Thanks, Amar. Uh, Roxanne Dunbar Ortiz. Yeah, thanks, Amar. Yeah, so this quote from an indigenous people's history of the United States sort of sets the scene for why we have this domination crisis continually unfolding before the eyes of many generations. And the quote kind of continues. Would anyone like to read the second part of it? Again, you can raise your Zoom hand or um, put a star in the chat. Amar, would you want to read the second part? Uh, I think Cynthia Papermaster was trying to read it, but her chat was coming to me as a direct message. Oh, well, apologies, Cynthia. I'm sorry you can't see the quotes. Uh, they're just on the screen share. So if you have something- I, I, think I, can, I think I can see it now. Oh, great. Do you want to read it? Um, Roxanne Dunbar Ortiz's quote? Yes, please. Okay. Settler colonialism as an institution or system requires violence or the threat of violence to attain its goals. People do not hand over their land, resources, children, and futures without a fight. And that fight is met with violence. 
in employing the force necessary to accomplish its expansionist goals, a colonizing regime institutionalizes violence. Roxanne Dunbar Ortiz, an indigenous, an indigenous people's history of the United States. Thanks, Cynthia. Beautifully read. And thanks, Amar, as well. Also beautifully read. So these two quotes lay out something that I think is incredibly important for us to see is that this domination crisis, the reason that we are in the type of climate crisis that our society is in is because our society is fundamentally one that has institutionalized systems that commit violence on behalf of corporate profits and state power. If we did not have a nation that was founded uh, on these premises in order to enact racial capitalism, in order to extract resources from people, then we may not have this whole mess in the first place. So we have this because of the way that our nation was founded, right? And these systems are still with us today. And, and I'll sort of illustrate that in a second, but first I just want to show you, uh, you know, as a brief sort of interlude, I just mapped out, you know, a handful of instances where this system has like kicked in in service of state and corporate power, but you can literally trace it all the way back, right? Back to ind indigenous genocide and slavery motivated by racial capitalism. Uh, the Revolutionary War, some argue, was used by elites to simply consolidate power. It's not this narrative that we hear of like freeing us from the yoke of the British Empire. Uh, we have fought wars with Mexico to gain enormous uh, US territory and called them backward savages and we needed to civilize them and et cetera, et cetera. This type of thing has always been the mode of operation of this country. Um, and why we have the flavor of climate crisis we have today is because a lot of these systems and ideologies have not changed. So when we think of what we need to do to stop the climate crisis, uh, knowing that we won't stop it until we address the cycle of militaristic repression, we have to change these systems and these ideological roots that has to be part of our organizing. So let's see, what did I have? Uh, so it turns out, like I said earlier, uh, this need for uh, institutionalizing ways to commit violence in order to maintain control uh, manifest in a handful of structures that we can analyze, social structures. Um, among them are things like the military, uh, the media propaganda system, uh, which, you know, if, if that's a shocking way to look at it, I'll kind of explain a little bit later. Um, the police, uh, the way that financial systems work, right? And we, we can wrap it all up in this sort of neat little box and say when, you know, state power is cooperating with private power in order to hold on to their power and kind of keep this whole cycle of violence going. We see it manifest in things like the military industrial complex, even though that has sometimes a more specific definition as well. Um, and these systems that were created to institutionalize racial capitalism uh, and all of these other things are still with us today. And they're a core part of the infrastructure that is causing and perpetuating the climate crisis. So I'll just give a few examples of each of these systems. I'll start with propaganda because that's actually what I study. So it's kind of a fun one for me to talk about. Uh, so I showed that timeline of uh, instances of mass violence that we had committed, the, 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 not we, but the US government and corporate powers had committed in order to expand their power or hold on to it. Uh, each of those is matched with a different propaganda campaign, right? Whether it's manifest destiny or, you know, shaking off the yoke of, of the British Empire in the Revolutionary War or Jim Crow or we need to annex Mexico because they're these backwards uncivilized people all the way through the Second World War with anti-Japanese rhetoric, Cold War rhetoric, anti-communism, the war on terror. Now it's stuff with China. It, it keeps going on, right? The propaganda system is very pervasive. And the propaganda machine has affected climate fights. So this is an example I love to give. Um, I won't go into great depth because I, I'm probably talking too much, but 
Uh, suffice to say, when the Green New Deal was first put forward and polling was done about it, it was incredibly popular across party lines with both Democrats and even conservative Republicans just loved it. They said they'd be in favor of all the things that it advocates for. And then months later, this, this group, the Yale Program on Climate Change Communication, did uh, a follow-up study and saw that the popularity had dropped a lot, specifically among conservative Republicans, even more specifically among those who watch Fox News a lot. So this, this, this targeted uh, campaign against the Green New Deal was whipped up because it threatened state power and the media systems who serve state power uh, sort of revved up in response. Uh, and let's also not forget that the fossil fuel industry has waged, I'll just say a straight up disinformation propaganda campaign for decades to cover up climate science. There are a lot of studies about this and, and we know this very well. Uh, and the tactics are at play right now, right? When we look at this uh, $3.5 trillion Build Back Better Act that the Biden administration is trying to push, uh, there, the business groups have like ramped up their propaganda to try to convince people that it's going to harm them, right? Business groups have coordinated attacks against the bill saying that, you know, oh, it's a big, uh, what did they say? It's, it's too uh, expensive, too large of a policy scope. It's going to increase your taxes. And these organizations like the American Petroleum Institute uh, has literally spent $500,000 on Facebook ads attacking the bill. And Exxon has spent $1.6 million on political and issue ads to try to kill the bill. So this is the degree to which they kick up their system to try to fight things that threaten their power. Uh, what about the police? So the police have roots in imperialism. Right? The US police is actually modeled after the British police force, which was developed when they were occupying Ireland. And they found out that a quote unquote peace preserving police was more effective for them than an occupying force. In the United States, police specifically developed in the US South uh, out of slave patrols, right? And colonial era militias. People have, uh, military generals have brought back tax tactics of war to the police. Police have been used against social movements like the Black Liberation Movement, against the Black Panthers. They had a hand in literally murdering Fred Hampton. Uh, embedding themselves into Malcolm X's security team and murdering Malcolm X. These people who they thought were rising up as black messiahs who would threaten the way that the system was working. So the police has always been a system of control. And we see this, for those of you who went down the line three like me, this Canadian corporation can literally pay the police in Minnesota to arrest, brutalize, and torture water protectors at line three while simultaneously using their propaganda system to make sure that word of it never gets out. Uh, and in total, Enbridge has paid $2.4 million to basically hire US police to, uh, to basically repress uh, organizers and water protectors. What about the financial system? Uh, well, the military, for those who study it, has always been you know, billed as this place of promise for the poor, right? who might rise in rank and acquire some money and change their social status, offering you know, adventure and rewards. Uh, and to date, the military for most of US history has been the only federal jobs guarantee. Uh, and they know this and they prey on financially disadvantaged people who seek military service as a means to make some money and survive. Uh, the DOD knows this. You can read the reports and see that they actually target people in this way. And now, nowadays they combine it with young people and they're more likely to, to target young, low-income people, predominantly people of color. Uh, and they literally say quotes like, the low unemployment rate and booming economy makes recruiting difficult, uh, especially when compared to past recruiting pushes during the Iraq and Afghanistan wars that lined up closer to a major global recession. They literally say stuff like this, but you just you know maybe haven't heard about it. Um, and this is in direct opposition to what we know we need to shift our economy uh, and, and the jobs that we do to ones that are life-sustaining rather than death-inducing, right? So this is in opposition to a jobs guarantee from a green deal, anything in the just transition framework that argues for a care economy, you know, the military and militarism wouldn't want this right? because they need the economic inequality, which is a form of violence that they perpetuate on society.
And finally, the military industrial complex is like a whole behemoth in and of itself, but Suffice to say, I'm sure a lot of you folks are familiar with this, right? It's this sort of thing that started in the Second World War when uh, this sort of uh, conglomeration of state and private power realized that they can make huge profits, profits from the war. Uh, and people like this old president of GE, who I used to work for, fun fact, uh, not that president, but GE, uh, argued for a permanent war economy uh, Eisenhower warned of this conjunction of a military establishment and large arms industry, and that's what we call now the military industrial complex, which has now grown to incorporate all these other systems that have been sort of created in times of crisis, uh, so-called crisis, manufactured crisis like the CIA and the FBI, and the NSA, uh, as well as Pentagon contractors, right? Private military industrial complex contractors. Uh, the State Department, the media, think tanks, lobbyists, universities, plenty of people at Tufts University do research for the military. And, you know, it's, it's this huge entrenched system. And, you know, what does that mean for the climate crisis? Well, you know, military technology, which we looked at earlier, has tons of money spent on it, will never address the climate crisis. It'll only make it worse. But this money and time are wasted, while priorities are skewed by propaganda. And in honesty, climate conflicts may lead to more profits for the military industrial complex. And there are some reports where these types of private contractors uh, say that that's something they want to take advantage of. So that's how pernicious these things are. And these are the systems that we have to see as part of the picture. Those are only a few of the structures, of course, but some of the main ones. And I promise if you're getting mentally fatigued, with you, this is, this is a lot of stuff, but there's even one more layer that I want to comment on, which is the things that underlie the systems we talked about, uh, the roots, right, uh, which describe the character of the United States and have been at play in wars, class domination, imperialism, colonialism, and are the same ideological roots that fuel the climate crisis. And among them, again, this is not everything, but among them as major contributors are racism and white supremacy, patriarchy and violence, and capitalist extraction. Actually, a few of the things that you all named very early on in the webinar. So you all are already on top of this. Um, and these, you know, when I was saying like the United, we, we have the type of climate crisis we have because the United States was founded as a settler colonial nation uh, hell-bent on instituting racial capitalism as a means of, you know, uh, becoming dominant in the world. Um, these are the same exact roots. We, we have still not kicked these, right? Uh, there's been a lot of movement and a lot of organizing against them, but they're still so pernicious, right? So we need to include them in our fight in the climate crisis or we'll never be able to address the thing in its entirety, right? So just some, some brief examples of each with racism and white supremacy, right? Militarism and racism evolved together. Each was justified, used to justify the other. This is, I guess I'm a fan of timelines. This is the same timeline that I used for the propaganda example. Almost all of these propaganda narratives are pretty racist and pretty white supremacist at their core. Um, and racism is fundamental the climate crisis issues, right? We can just rattle off a handful of the ones we already saw, migration, right? These unwanted starving immigrants, environmental justice, right? All these bases and this polluting infrastructure is built and marginalized in uh, communities of color and in poorer communities. Uh, conflict, right? We have to you know, protect our private property from threats by non-white people. Uh, pollution, you know, which we already talked about from these, these racist wars abroad. And even the propaganda system, right, sold as civilizing backwards people, right? This is always how it manifests. And these days we may see the word progress rather than civilization, but it's all the same thing. Uh, so that's like, you know, these roots are tied up. Patriarchy and violence, right? We can define patriarchy as a political social system that insists on patriarchs dominating, being superior and endowed with the right to dominate uh, through violence. And if this is ringing bells of the way that we interact with our ecosystem and the systems around us, that's exactly how it manifests, right? Uh, 
we, you know, people are indoctrinated into the system of patriarchy by uh, emotional neglect and numbing the way that we feel uh, in order to further imperialist goals and hatred and oppression. And the climate crisis comes as a result of violent domination over the planet in order to fuel human games of domination, right? And we, we stunt our relationship uh, that we have with the world that we're a part of. We think we're separate from it. Right? We think we can dominate it and control it. But that's absolutely not true. And we need to push back against that as we're going through these fights. And finally, capitalist extraction. I mean, this one may be obvious, but you know, mainstream economics wants you to think that you know, we're fighting over scarce resources. Right? I literally took these quotes from like a economic textbook that is the most read among like econ undergraduates in the country. Um, and it argues for like highly competitive markets, right? So scarcity and competition um, as, as means of organizing society, right? But competition comes, uh, creates the feeling that there are people out to get you, right? Uh, and it becomes synonymous with safety. And we have to push back against that and say, no, we have what we need to be safe already, right? We don't need to compete with each other. We don't need to treat resources as scarce. We should have a mindset of abundance, right? That's the real way we should interact with each other in our society. And then, you know, profits come into it as well. Um, and I also just wanted to note that in order to extract from something or someone, it first has to be viewed as a measurable resource, which is incredibly dehumanizing when it applies to people, right? Measuring people as numbers uh, and even to the resources around us. And I shouldn't even say resources, to the world around us. To turn the world into resources, you have to commodify it, right? And this is this sort of systematic, you know, uh, I don't even know what you want to call it, mathematicalization of, of just the world that we have to live in in order to fuel these systems. So, all right, we've been going, this is a lot. And I really like wanna say for these sort of underlying root types of ideological issues, it's not just enough to know about these things, but I think we really can't make change until we feel them. I mean, we have to feel how racism and white supremacy affects our lives. We have to feel how patriarchy and violence takes things away from our lives, and how capitalist extraction puts us in a bad place. So let's do one more. Actually, you know, I'm going to shift this up. So those of my tech team who are following my script and deviating from the script, instead of doing a processing breakout just because we're a little short on time, Maybe let's do a chat share back instead. So, you know, I'll, I'll leave some space so we can kind of let these sit with us and maybe just put some words in the chat for how these like ideologies, these ones that have led to these awful systems, how do they make you feel? And I'll, I'll uplift some of these. And I recognize these are very personal for everybody. So, you know, you can see people in their complexity when we when we share these. Gary put in devalued. Yeah, sad. Yeah. Sad over a lifetime of 71 years. Yeah, that's like a profound sadness. Yeah. Overwhelmed. Mm. Angry. Yeah. Disempowered, angry, sad, angry, but also energized. Yes, that tension is so hard to hold, but I absolutely feel that way as well. Weak, mm, worried for my descendants. If I think about that one too much, I'll start crying. Becoming emotionally numb, leading to addictive behavior of consumption. That's super eloquent, Nahi. Going from bad to worse. Yeah, that's heavy. Rebellious. Mm, yeah, yeah, this is such a natural response to want to fight back, right? And sometimes the system makes you feel like you can't, right? Or you're not able to. Feeling how privilege comes into it. That's real. That's absolutely real. Yeah, how privilege and our, our status 
intersects with this is, is very feelings-based. And I think that's a huge part of the work. Where to start in talking with others about it. That's so real. Waking people up. Yeah, building community around this. Aha. Ooh, it looks like Mohammed shared a really cool link. Yeah, so these, these emotional reactions and, and really feeling these things is something that I think is a huge part of how we need to sort of process this and, and really start to make change. Because if we just hold these intellectually, we, we really don't start to see these patterns everywhere. So thank you so much for sharing back. I, I really appreciate it because I know, you know, it's not a given uh, that, that we have the capacity or, or energy to, to feel these things and, and share them with others. So I really, really appreciate it. Um, and that's why I love being in groups like this because we can hold each other in these feelings and know that we can be with each other. So this sort of brings us, so we already shared back, <laughs> this brings us to kind of the end of this really long, like in-depth analysis where I feel like I took you through like a, like a movie where I was like, oh, but wait, here's this twist. And like, we really deconstructed this. So welcome. I'll, I'll give you each philosophy PhDs at the end of um, this session. But um, I just want us to like zoom out now and see what we made. Right, so we, we started right with just the climate crisis, just being fed by emissions and pollution. And then we expanded so many more things leading to the crisis. And then we said, oh, what does the crisis lead to? And we put out all these things and said, oh, but wait, when these things happen, when the crisis manifests, people react in a certain way. And that's what we're doing, right? We wanna protest and protect and organize and hopefully none of us have had to migrate, but I certainly know a lot of people who I know have had to. Um, but then the response to that response, right, because of this settler colonial militarized society that we live in, the response is one of militarizing borders, whipping up racist rhetoric, engaging the propaganda system, suppressing dissent and concentrating power. In the interest of protecting corporate profits and state power, which then feed back into the things that lead to climate crisis. And we laid out all of these structures that sort of fuel this crisis of domination that I named. And then we, yeah, saw and felt how the roots of these are really the same that have always fueled the story of the United States. And uh, I laid these out in this diagram somewhat purposefully in this shape because this is what I like to think of as being like a tree. Um, so this is what I call the tree metaphor, the tree model. Uh, and you can see it kind of looks like a tree, which is kind of cute on my part. But at the top, I call some of the first issues we looked at surface issues. Someone said those are the ones that we most immediately see. I absolutely agree with that. Uh, the ones that we looked at secondarily that kind of fuel this domination crisis, I call the structural le layer or structural level. And then finally, we ended by seeing that there's also roots, right? Like we use metaphors as if, you know, there's really no great meaning to them, but I think there really is great meaning to them. Um, and this tree model, I think, is something that can really help us like orient our organizing and, and really think about these things in a way that matches the complexity of the crisis that we know we need to think about if we're really gonna address this thing in the way that we need to. So now, wow, I feel like we've really arrived. Let's like, okay, maybe let's, let's do a celebration. We've arrived, team, let's celebrate. I'm about to throw some pluses in the chat. So cool. Whew. Yes, look at this like huge thing we built together. You all are such a great team. I appreciate you all so much. Um, so I will sort of conclude by saying, what does this mean for us? Well, oops, I lost my arrows. On the one hand, I hope that I've convinced you that the climate crisis cannot be separated from issues of justice and power. On the other hand, we're about to have three hands. On the other hand, militarism 
and climate are two parts of the same crisis. I hope I have persuasively argued that for you all. And then on the third hand, we can use this model to think about where to push and what to expect in response. And I think that's a huge thing that is important for our organizing because when we do certain tactics or when we talk to certain people about these, we can use this model to see like, okay, what would their reaction be? Because these things have been true throughout history. So we can plan, sort of see what they're gonna do, right? And we can head them off at the pass, so to speak. It's kind of a weird way of saying it, but. Um, all right, one twist before I truly leave you all. So I motivated this huge tree model and everything, but uh, here's my final big reveal. Uh, this tree is not just some indifferent tree that exists out in floating space, right? This tree uh, has to have grown in some sort of environment, right? It has roots, but it is rooted in some sort of substrate. Right? And it has grown because of certain conditions, right? certain sunlight, certain water quality. And this, I think, is really important to pull back and recognize because when we really run with the tree metaphor, these systems and this crisis that has developed has developed under a certain set of circumstances right? that have led to the development of racism, patriarchy, and violence, and capitalism that grew all these systems that are, that are leading to all the stuff we see. And when you think of how to address a tree, right? I don't think any of us can literally pull a tree out with our bare hands. Uh, maybe we'd need a lot of people to come together to try to pull a tree out. But if we try to hack off the branches of the tree, right? Probably new ones will just grow back. And yeah, it's hard to pull it out by the roots. But if we see the conditions, that the tree grew under and changed those conditions, the tree that previously grew may not be able to survive anymore, right? So I wanna argue that when we organize, a method that we can use in some of the most successful organizing has changed the conditions that our systems exist within, right? And I actually borrowed this clever metaphor from uh, the INE Institute, which is a movement training institute in Boston. They call this, they call the point of organizing changing the political weather, which I thought just beautifully fit with this whole tree idea. So when we change the political weather, what happens, right? Who has changed the political weather before? Well, look at the, you know, multi-layer, uh, you know, women's liberation movement, which has had, uh, you know, multiple waves, right? Uh, we're on like fourth wave feminism by this point. Uh, they have changed the political weather. Things that were not even thought possible before uh, are now possible, right? Workers, workers' movements have changed the political weather by humanizing themselves over and over again throughout history. Uh, the Black freedom struggle has changed the political weather in ways that are profound. And even though things are still bad today, they are vastly different than they have been in the past. And these struggles uh, have, have been going on for, for you know, centuries. And uh, I'll, I'll sort of lay out in the uh, anti-militarism organizing space, uh, there has been so much organizing that like, I feel like I brought us to kind of a sad place and an angry place, but let's get hype for a second about like, when we see this tree model for what it is and we wanna change the political weather, People have been doing it for so long, right? Let me build another timeline for you. People have been protesting and organizing against militarism since literally uh, against uh, impressment in England's wars in the 1700s against the Revolutionary War. When uh, like Jackson and the administration were uh, conducting what they called Indian removal, you know, there were mutinies in the army and people were trying to work with indigenous people to protect their land and certainly not as much as they should have, but to some degree, yes, people have been dissenting since even that long and fighting to protect indigenous land. People have opposed these big wars, right? Uh, said to civ be civilizing people in Mexico, right? And throughout this whole time under the system of uh, racial capitalism and slavery and colonialism, uh, 
at that time, slaves and, and uh, workers grew these huge multiracial revolts that were such a threat to the system that they you know, had to crack down and, and instituted things like Jim Crow afterwards and, and would you know, violently push down these rebellions. Um, and then even, even further on, when we think about the Spanish-American War, there was a huge labor and socialist opposition, right? World War I had opposition. Oh, I'm sorry, I jumped the gun. Maybe we should change that metaphor. But uh, opposition to the war in the Philippines, people dissented against the First World War, against the Second World War. People have organized against militarism uh, during the civil rights era, uh, anti-Vietnam, right? I can just like keep adding these and keep adding these. And there are so many examples of people rising up against like this truly enormous structure that this is like so deeply motivating to me. And people are still doing it today. When people go, have, have gone down to line three, locked themselves to pipelines and protected the water and, and showed up for the call from indigenous leaders. That is people pushing against this huge uh, tree model, this huge, these systems of domination and fighting to change the political weather. And just think for a second how different the discourse is today on October 16th, 2021 than it even was in, in January 16th, 2021. Uh, on these pipeline fights. Like I'm sure people who you didn't even think would be interested in those types of things are all of a sudden like, what is going on? We need to fight back. That is changing the political weather. And I just wanted to motivate this huge timeline because I fill with a tremendous amount of energy and hope and, and power when I recognize that we stand on the shoulders of giants. Like truly, truly people have fought so hard to get where we are today, we can fight exactly that hard. And today is always the best day to make change. And next time we're gonna talk about how to use this model to begin changing the political weather, analyzing a couple of specific issues about US empire uh, and exemplifying it in nu nuclear weapons and nuclear power, and then talking about how we can organize to change these things. So come back next week for part two, uh, a week from today, same time, same place. Uh, I wanna again thank our co-sponsors, Sunrise, Providence Hub, Boston Democratic Socialists of America, Eco-Socialism Working Group, uh, and of course, Mass Peace Action and 350 Mass for allowing me to talk until my throat kind of hurts for you all. Um, and I just want to say that um, we can begin to work on these things by getting organized, right? And, and the groups who have put this together and, and co-sponsored are fantastic groups to get involved with if you want to start working on these issues. I know probably most of you are already involved with some groups, so feel free to like throw your group and their contact info in the chat and we can save the chat and um, uh, share that back out because I am... We are gonna share the slides, uh, a recording of this, and I made a sheet of references as well so you all can dive in uh, in more depth. And we'll send that out soon.